in our lesson text out of James 2, 1 through 7, James illustrated a common problem in the early Christian Jewish church uh, from uh, Judaism legalism regarding the sin of partiality. Clearly taught in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, God is no respecter of persons. We, we studied that in the first lesson to show you the mental attitude sin of partiality, which other effects of the sin of partiality could be bias and prejudice and things of that nature. It was clearly, with, it was with clarity, I suppose I meant, uh, taught in the Old Covenant that God was no respecter of person. We, we studied that in Deuteronomy 10, 17 in the first hour. I wrote this down so, again, in the second hour, you could pay attention to the different uh, char characteristics of God mentioned in Deuteronomy that I thought was kind of interesting. One of them I thought was interesting is he's an awesome God. There's a popular uh, Christian song out uh, that's been out for a long time, an awesome God. And, and I know we used to sing at camps all the time, uh, the awesome God. But I want to talk about four things today about the sin of partiality in our, in our second hour. James illustrates the sin uh, of partiality, not if, but of, of uh, partiality by contrasting how different visitors were treated by the assembly. The wealthy were treated well, the poor poorly. And, and James make an issue of that. In the first hour, we, we uh, once again looked at the rhetorical questions that was really important for James to get his congregation to understand. James is teaching a congregation like me, uh, probably with better attendance, but here's what he says to him about it. He says, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you rhetorical questions so everybody get a hundred because the answer is going to be yes to all of them. But I want you to, what I want you to do is when you answer yes, to survey yourself. Because our congregation has a problem with partiality, he says. Here's the way we treat visitors, and it's wrong. But he doesn't say it's wrong and let it go. Rather, what James says, I want you to do a self-examination. I'm going to pose some issues with you. The answer is yes. I give you the answer so you won't have to think about the question. I want you to think how you relate to that question. Now, are you with me with that? Because he gave you the answer, right? Every rhetorical has a yes. The yes is intended to do a self-examination. Are you, how are you manifesting yourself with visitors coming to visit us? Here's what he says. He says, have you, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motive? And the, the, James says, this is what I see. Do you, do you agree with me? Well, he doesn't give you an option. He doesn't say, do you agree with me? He said it expects a what? <laughs> so he took that out, didn't he? He didn't say, I want your opinion. How do you want to vote? He took it off, took it off the table. And therefore, the first question, he actually tells you, if you think that way, your mind is operating from an evil motive. What is your motive for doing that? Are you thinking to get something from the rich guy the poor man could not give you anything? I mean, why would you treat the poor man that way and the rich man that way if you didn't think that the rich man maybe could help you and the poor man has nothing to offer you? In fact, he probably wants something from you like you want from the rich man. Say, he's posed a lot of questions with this when he answers yes. He said, remember, have you not made discriminating, have you not made distinction or discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil? Because he doesn't matter who he assigns to be the usher bringing in visitors. This is the way the congregation was thinking. Everybody he had did the same thing. And he went, that's got to stop. I've, I, I've run out of ushers. <laughs> Y'all think this, we got to change, we got to change the way we think about our visitors. Here's the second thing. He said, did God not choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and, and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Yes. 
But see, God's standard is so different than the world. This was God's standard, but see, they were buying into the world's standard of how you judge people. He said, you know, the, look, at all the, look at all these poor people sitting on the floor here. This is what James is going to do. He said, look at all the poor people sitting. See, on each row, he would go like, see, on each row, see the two people sitting on the, on the carpet? See, they were pretty obvious, weren't they? Nobody was sitting on the good seats. See, everybody who's not seated that in the good seats, see, they're seated on the floor. So did, and this is what he says. I want to speak to you, but all of you sitting on the floor, I want you to listen to me. And I want to apologize for our congregation. Because this is going to stop. And here's what he says. Did God not choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? See, everybody knew that to be true. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Did God not love you when you were slaves in Egypt? Were not the promises he promised you when you were you were you were considered worse than the dirt that you stood on in Egypt. Now think about that. When they were slaves, they were thought less worthy than the ground on which they stood. You know, you've heard people refer to people as dirt. Have you not? Dirt poor. The Yotes, the Yotes boys lived across the street from us. There were five boys. Their dad was an oil rigger. He was gone for weeks. And he would show up. He was a good man, but he worked hard. He would show up once or twice a month with a payday, and the rest of the time he was out in the oil fields. He'd bring the money through. I think maybe it was once a month, and they had to spread that money out among these five boys and that wife, no cars or anything, had the little store down the neighborhood, little country store, Mr. Butler ran, and Mr. Butler would extra supply things just for that Yost family because she had no way to go to town to get it. So Mr. Butler's little business, gas, little sir, gas pump out front, a little store, just to get you by, had to supply extra supplies for the Yost family. I never saw so many boxes, and I went over and played with them. I never saw so many boxes of Wheaties. Is, is that the brand of, of champions? Wheaties. I think she must have bought I, I never saw so many. She had them boxed up. I mean, stacked right up boxes. And that's what they lived on at the end of the month. They ate cereal every day, morning, noon, and night. That's how, that's how she made it until he could come back with some groceries. Well, I went home and I told my mother. I'd never seen so many boxes of wheat, of whatever that, wheat, Wheaties. I never saw so many in my life. I mean, they got them stacked up to the ceiling, ma. Well, I didn't think anything about it. Except the kids said, that's what we, I said, how come you got so many boxes like that? They said, well, that's what we live in at the end of the month. I'm like, all right. I go home and I tell my mother. My mother, she, goes, she gasps at it. So my mother, next thing I know, my mother's across the street talking to the lady. So at the end of the month, I began carrying stuff over to them, soups and, you know, one meal kind of, you know, one pot of something to go with those Wheaties. I tell you, they were, really were the breakfast of champions. That, that family proved that. They should have put them on the box. 
when those little guys would be dirty over with us playing and they'd be hungry and, you know, I'd be ready for a snack. Oh, man. Mother would bring them in, wash the little face, wash their hands off, take care of them, love them. And whatever I snacked on, they snacked on. That was kind of the way the community I was raised in. It wasn't just my household. Every, everybody in the community looked out for people like that. You know what that was? No respect of persons. Nobody, nobody. No, us farm people, farm people didn't. There was no status. Everybody was hard work and dirt people. And I'm so thankful for it today. I'm so thankful for it. Did not God choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Next time you think you don't have a, a dollar a pot, Just remember, you've been, you've been chosen by God. Listen, listen. Did God not choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith? Let me tell you, have all the, all the money in the world and not have faith in God, in Christ Jesus, you're the poorest person in the world. The poorest person in the world that has faith in God and through Jesus Christ is the richest man in the world. That's what James says, because you see, God's standards are different than the world. When you find yourself in the world's standards, you need to step out of there and back into the kingdom where everybody's treated without any respect of person. Without respect of person. Is not the rich who oppress you pers and personally drag Is not the rich man the one who oppresses you and personally drags you into court? And then he gives a great statement in verse 6 you want to remember. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you are called? Why do you show respect for people who will run over you and, not, and leave you on the side of the road like a dead animal? They don't see any difference in you. So James made a very strong, uh, and listen, he's talking to his congregation. This is how God treats us. He gives you the answers before the test so that you can always be a 100 percenter. That's why you should always come to church. When you can't come to church, you pick us up online. When you can't pick us up online, you go in. Every day you ought to study the word of God. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. What do you mean you're too busy? Well, God can, if, you, if, if it's a matter of time, he can take your job away. Now you got time. He could take your health away from you. Now you got time. There's a lot of things you should be thankful for that you're not thankful for. That things that you take for granted that should be taken for grace. It's true in my life as well. I'm not pointing my finger out without three pointing back. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. Now he's talking about temptation. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted, there's the word, beyond what you are able. But you know what he will? He will tempt you every bit to what you are. You know what I mean? In other words, he's going to put you in a situation that's going to call for the doctrine he has taught you and you have cycled it into your heart. He's going to call it out. And when he calls it out and you don't respond in the proper way, he holds you accountable for the doctrine that's in your soul. And so the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart first and he says, you know better. Why are you not doing what? Do you know, listen to me, and I, I don't want an answer from you. I want you to answer yourself. Do you know when the Holy Spirit speaks to you? I mean, 
How are you walking in the Spirit when you don't know the Spirit? Because He very definitely, He walks you, He talks you, He guides you, He instructs you. I mean, if you read John 14, 15, 16 and see what He does for the believer, He ought to be doing it in your life. Listen to me now. Now listen to me. You've got to walk a while with him in the spirit to really pay attention to that still small voice. You've got to pay attention to the, the inner voice that speaks the truth of the word of God in your soul. And one day, if you'll practice the principle of walking in the power of the person of the Holy Spirit, he will speak loudlier to you than you speak to yourself. That inner dialogue, that inner dialogue that goes between you and you, that will become static so that you can listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you loudly. The inner dialogue, when it's between you and you, it's between you and your flesh. When you're talking to the Holy Spirit, it's between you, it's between you and the Spirit. And when you learn to do that, you will learn some marvelous lessons about what it means to walk in the Spirit. You will learn it by your inner dialogue. Listen to me. Josh and I talked about this one day. The time gap, when something happens and you go into inner dialogue, the time gap between you dialoguing with yourself and switching over to dialogue with the Holy Spirit is a key to show how well you're developing in the spiritual life. You may be growing in the Word of God, but you're not growing in the power of the Spirit. The time gap, when you fall into inner dialogue, the time gap from falling into it and getting out of it into the ministry of the Holy Spirit is key to growth. It, not to your, not to the spiritual growth in the Word of God, to the, to your maturity in walking in the Spirit. You pay attention to that time gap. That time gap would tell you more than you could possibly imagine. Time gap, that time gap, that time gap, that time gap should be. Should, should never be more than minutes, never hours, never days, never weeks, never months, never years. It, and listen, it should move from minutes to seconds. You know who's in control of that? You. Your volition. So when something happens and you immediately go to inner dialogue, don't go to the flesh. If you did, jump right back. Shut it down and go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And, and you will all begin to habitually do this and that what you're after is time gap. Been working on that, Josh? Thank you, buddy. Shouldn't have called you out like that, should I? Thank you, Jesus. Shouldn't have done that. Because you might have went, mm-mm. <laughs> Then I went, oh, I should have done that. I apologize. Two, the believer can please God. A believer can please God, but never earn his respect. Listen to Romans 8, 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, I may have it somewhere. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 6. I didn't. You should have it somewhere. 
Oh, I did put it there. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. How are you going to please God? Walk by faith. Walk in the power. Don't walk in the flesh. Walk in the power of the spirit. Don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. You want to please God? Listen, you ought to want to please God more than man, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You, you want to see how, listen, God respects Job. I wrote it down, Job, the second chapter, verse 3, worth your read. He told the devil, I respect Job. Man, and he, and he goes through a description of him, tells you why he, was, he respected Job. He respected Job because Job respected him. He did it with John the Baptist in Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse 11. Jesus says, I have great respect for John the Baptist. Listen, when a Godhead speaks that way, that's pretty powerful stuff. The Judaizers, the legalists of the Jerusalem Christian Church, ascribed a higher reputation to those of the law than those of grace. If you were a legalist, <clears throat> you were in high cotton. If you're a grace, if you were grace camp, you were worse than the dirt. Isn't it interesting how some of them described the poor people coming in? Dirt poor. I never heard about poor when I was a farm boy. I never heard poor and rich until I went to the city. No such thing as poor. Not where I live. Therefore, those who promote legalistic theology consider themselves to be theological higher or superior than those of grace theology, like Paul and Barnabas. This is called the sin of partiality. Galatians 2.2, 2. it was because of revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, Paul said. And who did they go up to see? The pillars of the church. He went to the Jerusalem church and talked to the big guns. But I did, I did so in private to those who were of reputation. Dokio, 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 of reputation. Those who other people had opinion of, and they had opinion of them themselves. Rep men of reputation, for fear that I, be, I might be running or had run in vain. He said, I went to the big guys. I was, I was into ministry. I was, I was young. I was new. I went to them to see. In verse 6, he says, but from those who were of high reputation, I held opinion, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. You know, when I got there, he said, I found out there were men just like me. They're struggling with the same things, if not others. And I found out that we, in our theology, were apart a little bit. And I wondered to myself, how, how, how was that possible? We were clear on the gospel that Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead, but we had problems even there on the mechanics of how you were saved. They believed it was okay if you, bled the, if you believed the gospel, but you had to be circumcised as well. He said, I had a lot of problems. Paul said, I had a lot of problems with that. What do I do with the women in my church? I had a lot of problems with this. I believe that we're all under the same banner. I believe there was no male or female in Christ. We were all one. I believe that. And now I go over here to the, Christ, the Jewish Christian church, and they go, oh, no, no, no. We're not all alike. There is the rich and the poor. There is the wealthy and the... And, and, and the he said they, everything was in some kind of class form that showed partiality.
He says, for me, I tested everything they said in their partiality. I tested it by the principle God is no respecter of person. And if they showed partiality to person, I checked it off. That's wrong. I used the word of God as my guide on, my standard. And when they said, no, you got to be a Jew. A Gentile can be saved, but he's got to be a Jew as well. I checked it off. God's no respecter of person. When they said, only the man, I checked it off. O only, only the rich, I checked it off. Only the free man, I checked it off. Because God is no respecter. All of that was respecter of persons. I wonder, how, I wonder how Paul would evaluate our churches today in America. How would he evaluate our church here at Doctrinal Studies? I'll tell you how he will. By the way you evaluate him and the changes you make in your life. We're to be no respecter of persons. Listen to what he said. Here's what I discovered when I met with them. I discovered those who were of re reputation contributed nothing to me. I thought I was going to go and meet with some people that we'd be on the same line in theology. When I got there, I found out we were light years apart. And I discovered when I left that I had got nothing beneficial to my life under grace. All it was was legalism, 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 respect, respect of people, respect of people. I left with nothing. And have you people meet with us? They ought, to, they ought to leave fuller than they came. They come hungry, they should leave fed. Whether it's me in the pulpit or you in the pew, when people come and you spend any length of time with them, their life should be more beneficial in Christ than it was when they came. That's what we are as ambassadors of Christ. We need to be the real deal. In Galatians 2.9, Paul writes, And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me, Bar to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they did the circumcised. They said, well, look, we're just going to have to live with our differences. You go to the Gentiles and we'll stay with the Jews. And the church was split. And they stay split all the way through the book of Acts. You know what happens at the, by the end of the book of Acts? There is no more Jewish church. It's gone. Out. It's gone. That's how quick it can happen. Because God is a God of grace, not of law. He's a God of grace, not of law. All of this was to be settled at the Jerusalem conference in Acts 15. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus the same way as they are. And they had developed what was known as the first apostolic creed recorded in Acts 15, 22 and 29. And when the conference was over, they still went their separate ways. And it's the rest of the book of Acts. Positional sanctification places all church age believers in the same righteous status in Christ Jesus. That's positional sanctification. Here's what Paul says. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ, 20 status privileges. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And so it is. Let me tell you, the worst the worst of the sins in a church is a sin of partiality. It's what divides us. We have to be one in Christ. Our division should be from the world, not from each other. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today that James has reminded us of the struggles within the Christian church. And boy, James had them, and he recognized them and fought them. And there, 
listen. You have to tell people the truth, and the truth, the truth will separate you. You don't have to tell people if you don't believe it my way, the highway. They'll automatically do it. They'll automatically. Law versus grace is a divider. You have to be all in one or the other. It's like spirituality. It's either all spirit or all flesh. There's no in-between. It's all faith or it's all sight. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. We are to be no respecters of person. There's no in-between. Teach us that, Father. May we be that church. Welcomes everybody in Christ. We are one in Christ. We are one in Christ. We are one in Christ. We thank you for it. It is the principle of grace, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.